Buddhasa Aparuta te sang amatasa duara yeso tevanto paman cantu So at the uh, recent ASA conference yesterday, uh, of course we had many wonderful Dharma talks from many different people, but it's funny how you hear different things and uh, some things stick in your mind and some things don't. And one thing that, that uh, I think stuck in everybody's mind from that talk and uh, has a habit of these is, is the, some of the stories of the very wonderful bhikkhuni from uh, Perth, Venerable Hui Khan. And uh, she, she always teaches by telling stories, one of the great storytellers, so I can't resist trying to uh, retell one of her stories which anybody would remember after hearing that. And this was the story of this little boy in Vietnam who was a very obedient child, always do what he's told, okay? Obviously not an Australian kid. <laughs> so whenever mum and dad would tell him to clean up his room, he'd always clean it up. And uh, whenever they tell him to not make noises while he's eating, then he would eat quietly and all of these things. So one day, the parents, mum and dad, decide they have to go away for a trip for a few days and leave the kid looking after the home. And uh, when they did this, they have, they have an idiom in Vietnamese. Kim would know what the idiom is. You've forgotten. Kim's forgotten the idiom already. So, you know, in, 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 in English, you'd say, you say you're like house sitting. Yeah? So, you, you know, you use an idiom to sit the house, but actually, you know, you're not really sitting in the house. But in, in Vietnamese, the idiom translates as to mind the door. Okay, so they went away and they sold their, their, their little boy, please mind the door. So he said, all right. So they went off and so he minded the door. And he's just kind of sitting there, keeping an eye on the door and making sure the door's okay. And uh, that was all right. One day passed. And then the next day passed and there was a Vietnamese opera down at the other end of the village. And they started playing this Vietnamese opera music. I don't know if any of you came to the fundraiser that the Vietnamese people did for us in, uh, where was it, in Cabramatta or something uh, this year, one this year and one last year and one the year before. And they had various kind of Vietnamese pop singers and all of these kinds of things. But they also had one who did the Vietnamese opera. So it's worth it. The whole night is worth it just to go for those few minutes of hearing the Vietnamese opera because it's absolutely fantastic. I can hi highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this there were a very intense kind of thing. And so apparently, according to Venerable Hui Khan, that, that uh, for Vietnamese people, when they hear this, they just love it so much and, and they can't resist this Vietnamese opera. So the little boy was sitting there in the home thinking, oh, I have to go down and see this opera. But I can't. I have to stay here and mind the door. But I, I really have to. I can't miss out. You know, we only get this once a year. You know, it's a very rare occasion in our little village. But I have to mind the door. How can I do this? So he thinks to himself, right, gets a screwdriver, takes the door off the hinges. <laughs> <laughs> carries it down with him and watches the opera, minding the door. It's fine, that's no problem. He's a very obedient little child. The opera finishes, he comes back home. And when he gets back home, the burglars have been, they've stolen everything out of the house. It's completely empty. It's all gone. And he thinks to himself, my goodness, that's dreadful. He thinks, wow, it was really lucky I was minding the door. <laughs> Otherwise, that would have gone too. <laughs> so this is the story of how to mind the door. And so now, having being being a Buddhist monk, my job is not just to tell the story, but then I have to draw a lesson out of the story. There has to be a purpose to it. You can't just tell stories for amusement's sake. So now I have to try to figure out what kind of message I can draw out of that story. And the, the message which I would choose to draw out of the story at the moment is, is a, um, this, uh, 
relation or connection in Buddhism, we have these two terms between what we call sati and sambhajanya, okay? And these two Pali words. Uh, sati we usually translate as mindfulness, although more literally it means memory. And sampajanya, we usually translate as something like clear comprehension or, or full awareness or something like that. So these two words, which are usually used together, okay? So you usually have a compound, sati sampajanya, or else if not in a compound, then in, in close connection, like satoja sampajano. So they're very closely connected words, and it's not easy to sort of tease out the uh, difference between them or, or what, whether they really just mean the same thing or whether they have a slightly different nuance. But according to the tradition, they do have a different uh, nuance and the, 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 the implications of each is slightly different. And uh, we can think of that as... Um, and put, try, try to put it in as simple or direct, most direct terms possible. Sati is the, um, the 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 focusing of awareness, and sampajanya is the contextual understanding. Okay, sati is like the focusing of awareness, and maintaining of awareness. Sampajanya is contextual understanding. And so usually in the uh, way it's explained in the commentaries, they give uh, four kinds of, what they, of sampajanya. I don't know if I can remember all the four kinds off the top of my head, but uh, one is the clear comprehension of uh, one's purpose. Actually, that's probably the most important one, of clear comprehension of purpose, of suitability and resort. These are three of them. I can't remember the four. But they're all about somehow understanding What's the context of what you're doing? Okay. And so, in the, you know, using that example of the little boy with the door in the house, of course, he was minding the door. Yeah. So, his mindfulness, he had his focused awareness on the door. Yeah. So, that's a lot like us in our meditation. We're told to mind the door, we're told to watch our breath. Right. And so, we're watching our breath going in and out. But very often, we're actually watching our breath in the same way that that little boy was minding the door. Yeah. We take the instructions very literally. Oh, meditation means watching the breath. Yeah? But are we watching the breath? What's the purpose of watching the breath? Of course, to look up, to mind the door meant to look after the house. That's what it meant. So when we say to watch the breath, what we mean is to look after your mind. Yeah? Look after your body and your mind. And we see that in the breath and to look after that. Okay? And so it's not just watching the breath. Okay, watching the breath isn't the, the, the isn't the, isn't, the, isn't the end of things. So you know, he takes off the door. He's minding the door perfectly well, but he misses the point and the whole point of the practice. And so, so the whole everything gets taken out. So this is like a meditator who's trying to follow the letter of a meditation instructions. They've been told watch the breath, or they've been told do this or do that, and they try to do that thing that they've been told to do. They try to follow the meditation instructions, but they're so busy following the meditation instructions, they forget, what is the purpose of this? What am I actually doing here? And they forget that context. So this is that sati and sampajanya, which is a very important thing for us to, to always bear in mind in our practice. And these things both need to be there, and they both need to be fully there and fully present. And so in a sense, we can think of sati in many ways as like a narrowing and a focusing of it's the, the, the specificness. I don't mean narrow in, a, in like a, um, a limited way, but I mean in a, in a, spe in a, in a, in a specific way. Sampajanya is the broadening of the understanding of the context. And so those, those, those two things both need to be there. Yeah. So... This, is, this aspect of sampajanya, I think, is very important and something that we really, we, we really need to consider. Now, it doesn't just apply in meditation. And uh, when I, I mentioned that before about sampajanya uh, in the commentaries, one of them is the purpose. Okay? So the example it often gives in that is, 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 is for like a monk or a nun who's going for alms rounds. So, okay, you know what is the purpose 
of what I'm doing. And so you know that the purpose is, is the right purpose, and you understand why am I going into town with my bowl, so that's okay. Another one, you understand the suitability. Okay, you understand that I, as a mendicant, as a bhikkhu or bhikkhuni, this is my livelihood, right? This is the proper thing for me to be doing, is to be going into town, carrying a bowl and collecting arms. So we understand this is a suitability. And so these are things which also affect everybody in, in, in terms of um, their livelihood and, and how we live, that we understand that what we're doing is suitable for our job, for our profession. And uh, you know, in each uh, person who has a job, usually you, know, you have something like a code of ethics or something like that, which goes along with your, uh, your profession. You know? And so doctors have a particular code of ethics or lawyers will have a code of ethics. And this will, or within a particular company or place of work, they'll have a code of ethics. And so you have to understand that within this context that it's appropriate for me to act in certain ways uh, to say certain kinds of things or not say certain other kinds of things. And so this is your understanding of the suitability. And this is part of your practice of mindfulness. Okay? So this is something, again, which I think tends to get neglected. And people think that being mindful means you know, knowing my hand is here and my hand is there. And all of these kinds, but it's only part of being mindful. There's only one aspect. You can know that your hand is there, but also knowing what's what's the suitability of it. So sitting watching your breath is a great mindfulness practice, right? But it's not a very good mindfulness practice if you're supposed to be doing a job, yeah. And you know, you maybe you're you're, you're sitting there supposed to be doing uh, the example I gave earlier, doing the accounts. You know, you're supposed to be working as an accountant in a firm, and you've been given a job, and you sit there and you watch your breath. Well, obviously. You might be very mindful. I knew my breath very clearly. The boss comes up and tells you off. What are you doing? I said, Why? I knew my, I'm breathing in. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I have to be very clear about that. <laughs> breathing out. My breath's going really fine and subtle. <laughs> so there's, some, there's mindfulness is there, but there's no sampajanya. It's not, the, it's not the appropriate place for you to be doing that. There's a story I heard about one, one, one ex-monk who told me this story, and, and he, he was in... Um, a Thai monastery in, in uh, a forest monastery in Thailand, Ajahn Ben's monastery, and he had uh, his monk had when he was a monk he had very good meditation and he was sitting samadhi outside, and this big bus of tourists came up and he was kind of sitting there, he's kind of Western monk sitting there and it was a bit of a novelty, and so they all sort of came up and he said he was just in this state he wasn't like in deep samadhi where he couldn't see or hear anything he could he knew that people were coming up around him he could hear them and so on. But he was in this state where he, he was just very um, uh, disconnected from it. He didn't identify with anything that was going on. And so people, they'd come up and say, hello, you know, what are you doing, venerable, and so on. And, and he just ignored them. He just sat there meditating. And uh, they kept on saying louder and louder. And then eventually they'd be like clapping next to his ears and things like that. And he could hear everything, but just not reacting in any way. And then they just started calling out, hey, come and see this Western monk sitting in Jhana over here. Oh, come and see. And so they started calling out and everyone came around. It was like the tourist attraction, the whole bus load coming. Oh, oh. you can poke him and stuff like that. And he just kind of sat there. And uh, afterwards, uh, his teacher, Ajahn Ban, really blasted him afterwards, you know, and, and just told him it was how totally inappropriate it was to be acting in that kind of way. And... Uh, Again, this is mindfulness. His mindfulness is very strong, but his sampajanya, his clear comprehension, was not strong. Yeah? He didn't have that contextual awareness. And so this is very, very important for all of us. And this is an aspect of, uh, partly an aspect of right livelihood, how are we making our living, how are we doing things in a broader sense that is going to be um, uh, meaningful and connected with the Dhamma. Now, the, the, the theme for the talk tonight I wanted to talk about was was greed and green, okay? So this this kind of aspect of of also of understanding and being conscious of how our choices affect uh, people around us and also the environment is also very very important. Okay, we all know that it's that it's a good idea to to you know to protect the environment. We all know it's a good idea to change our light globes and use you know power saving light globes and to try to buy a smaller car or to um, uh, uh, you know, insulate our house and all of these kinds of things. But, but these things are often very surface. Yeah? 
And it was interesting, there was an interesting discussion I was reading on The Guardian some time ago, earlier this week, and they were saying that one of the problems in the environmental debate recently is that there's a disjunct between the seriousness with which the environmental problems are presented and the uh, almost frivolity with which the solutions are presented. So it's like, you know, the world's going to end. Oh, well, if you get a different kind of light bulb in, then we'll be fine, you know, and uh, put up a solar panel and, uh, you know, uh, catch the bus to work. Oh, and then the world will be fine, you know. Um, it's obviously, it's, there's more to it than that, but this has been a tendency that I think we've been trying to present the things to us uh, in, an, in, in a way that's not too frightening. We don't, want to, we don't want to intimidate and scare people, but it ends up being so watered down that it becomes a little bit unbelievable. There's a kind of a, a gap between how serious the problem is and how lightweight the solution is presented as being in some cases. And uh, so one of the respondents on this discussion commented, oh, well, we're not going to all go back and live in yurts with candles. And I was looking at it thinking, well, why not? <laughs> I think that's exactly what we are doing. And uh, it was just interesting to see that, you know. It was almost like this kind of... Um, no, see, the way that it was phrased was, oh, we're not going to do this. Of course, no one had suggested that they do that before, but it was almost like a subconscious thing that, that, he, that well, he or she or whoever said that and the person that they were... people that they were speaking to underneath, somehow they knew there was like an, an acknowledgement that something like that actually is a very appropriate response and, and may be necessary. It may be the fact that, that society falls apart so drastically that actually we will have to end up living in civil hearts with candles. That's one outcome. And uh, there's also there was a report that came out within the last week. Apparently the... the um, the uh, most accepted prediction for for sea level rises within the next hundred years uh, has been uh, 59 centimeters. So it's expected that the most likely uh, rise of the sea level within a hundred years will be 59 centimeters, which is obviously uh, a huge rise and we have a tremendous impact. But there's been recently a report put out in the last week by NASA and they um, predict they their scientists said that the 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 models on which that that prediction were implausible and unlikely that it would rise 59 centimeters and their prediction was that the sea levels would rise 25 meters within the next hundred years so this is the latest prediction So we're starting to get nervous now. Maybe the yurts aren't such a bad idea after all. Yeah. So this is where we have to start thinking that something a bit deeper has to go on. It's not good enough just to change your light bulb over. Yeah. It's not good enough just to think, well, I'll catch the bus to work. Something much deeper has to go on, and we have to start looking at our lives in a different way. And we have to start, have to start, and it's not just a matter of. Um, of tinkering around the edges. Yes, there are uh, things that can be done and there are technological solutions and technological fixes to things. But we tend to think of things in, in we still tend to think of things in a very limited, uh, a very particular way. So we think that all oh, a certain chemical is bad because it lasts for a certain time in the environment and creates certain effects. We have these very kind of particular things. But to me it seems like there's, there's also more general principles which we can and we should reflect on. Uh, one of those is that uh, 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 which is something, is something really basic to me, which I'm trying to, I'm trying to articulate, something like uh, that whenever you do anything and you man whenever you manipulate materials, then this creates an energy cost. And the more you manipulate materials, the more that something is removed from its natural state and the greater complexity that's introduced into that, then the greater energy that's required to do that. Yeah? Right? So to get a rock and to bung rocks on top of one another and to build a wall takes a relatively little energy output. Yeah? To get those same rocks and put them into a cement factory, grind them down into cement and do that takes a, a tremendously much larger amount of energy. 
So the more that things are left in natural state, yeah, the less that they're actually transformed, the less energy is required to actually do that. Yeah? And that's something that's very interesting to reflect on. So sometimes I wonder, you know, I wonder, you know, we go into all these technological fixes. So of course we can have friendlier technology and we can and we should and we should have better technology to do all of these things. But are you going, in a sense, are you going further down that road? Are you actually creating things that are more complex, more, uh, uh, taking more energy to use them and produce them and that actually maybe have further effects down the track, which we don't predict at the moment, yeah? We can maybe solve one crisis, but are we kind of lurching into another crisis, which we haven't even learned to predict? This is what I, I kind of fear. And so to, to think of or to contemplate on... on a more systemic or more fundamental uh, way of responding to these things is, of course, looking at what is the causes. Why, why do we want these things? Why, why are, are governments so reluctant to make these changes? Yeah? Why are we so reluctant to make these changes? Well, obviously, because we don't want to compromise our lifestyle. And, and this is exactly what the Americans did when, in Kyoto. And, and, you know, I think Bush or whoever it was and basically said, the American lifestyle is not up for negotiation. Full stop. Right? So that, that's, that's what's not actually being negotiated. So we want to tinker around the edges and change things, but we don't want to make fundamental changes to our lives. But what I'm suggesting is that maybe we do need to make more fundamental changes to our lives. Maybe we do need to to start living in yurts with candles. If a yurt with a candle in it is fairly energy efficient, then a cave with a candle is even more energy efficient. Yeah, Or a cave with no candle, if you're sitting there meditating at night, is even more efficient altogether, isn't it? Yeah? So if we were, if, what would happen if everybody was to do that? We could all go back and live in caves. Yeah? I don't know if there's enough caves for everybody. Yeah? And so this is, this is something I've always reflected on for myself as a, as a, as a bhikkhu, that you know, how, how you can really get by with very little resources. And uh, of course, you know, when I was a, a young monk in Thailand, and, and I, I'll hear launch into a when I was a young monk story, and it was quite, we had some quite fun last night because Chi Guang Sunim was there in, at uh, Santi Monastery. And she was telling her when I was a young nun stories about her time in Korea and oh, when I was a young nun and we had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and cook the food and we had to go around and light all the fires for everyone and blah, blah, blah. And we were told, I was told I had to cook the food for 100 people on this retreat and went into the kitchen and there wasn't any food there. I went out and they said, <laughs> and they said, I said, how do you cook this food? And she, they said, well, there's some, there's, there's like weeds and things growing out there. You can pick some vegetables out of the forest or whatever it is, and you'll be able to do it. So she had to contact her mum in Australia and get her to send over some money so she could get, go down to the market and get some food and so on. And uh, so she was telling all these stories, and then when she was finished, I let her respectful moment go past, and then. Couldn't help it. <laughs> I said, well, when I was a young monk, we had it tough. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so when I was a young monk, we were living <laughs> a hut. We, we wouldn't have given for a hut. We had a bamboo platform in the middle of the forest with a mosquito net with the worst kind of cerebral malaria in the world. And I had to cook. The previous cook had died of cerebral malaria, right? <laughs> this, is, this is true. <laughs> I'm telling these stories and no one would believe me. And <laughs> the, the, there were tigers in that forest. The, the, one of the monks came back from the meal time and the monks went before him. And uh, he came 10 minutes later after the other group of monks. And after that 10 minutes, he, there were footprints. we saw the footprints in the mud. And then there was a tiger print on top of the, the monks who went before him. There was a tiger print. And he's looking, oh, where's the tiger gone? Another monk was there. He had an elephant walk onto his walking meditation path. So he's just sitting there on his bamboo platform 
with a mosquito net, which is a lot of protection against an elephant. And <laughs> there's an elephant, wild jungle elephant just over there. So this is like not the true meaning of yeah, So this is a... One, I was there with one other, uh, an agarica. He used to walk down before me to go down the path, and he used to carry a stick with him to hit on the ground to scare the snakes away on the path. And uh, so we had to get up. Sometimes we'd be meditating all night. You have to get up, walk down this muddy path for an hour, crossing over creeks in the dark, to get down to the uh, kitchen where you'd have to cook meal for 20 monks by 8 a.m. in the morning on a, a coal fire with one wok, and a chopping board. I had an assistant cook who was deaf and dumb. <laughs> and that's true, all right? I'm not making this up. He was deaf and dumb. They called him Tommy. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> and you can ask, he's called Tommy. <laughs> um, one morning when I, I had been up all night meditating and trying to cook, because you're wearing white, yeah? And uh, it's very difficult to keep your white clothes clean. It's especially difficult to keep your white clothes clean when it's dark and you've been up all night and you're trying to stay awake and you've got a, 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 a bucket of slops and rubbish from the kitchen which you want to throw into the rubbish pit. But you can't quite see where the edge of the rubbish pit is so you fall into it which is like about four metres down with like a month's full of food refuse. <laughs> in, uh, and it's sort of fall, falling into that and then scrambling out again and uh, trying to wash yourself off and continue to cook. So that was my experience. So I trot this out and then trying to cook the food. And, then, and, I, so was, and of course you're being in a place which is so isolated that because you can't get any supplies there, we, we had to be in the army in to get us out, literally, we had army trucks come in, and that was a good year. In a bad year, they can't even see where the road used to be, right? <laughs> so they have to bring helicopters in to get the planes out, it also has happened. So this place called Daodam in Thailand, so this is my, when I was a young monk story, so this I usually, <laughs> I usually... I usually trot this one out when people start complaining about the conditions in the kitchen at Santi Monastery. They say, oh, we have to work so hard. I say, well, you have to work hard. <laughs> <laughs> but what you did learn from that, and of course, uh, you know, is you learn is what li how little you can get by with, you know, and, and, and still be happy, you know. And uh, I'm just trying to, trying to restrain myself from going into a Yorkshire action. <laughs> but the... Uh, <laughs> how, and we, it, it, that, that was like one of the happiest periods of my life, you know? Because just, you were just there, you know? And it was, it was this experience of being there was just, just quite... quite um, Something was just totally beyond anything which I'd imagined or, 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 or um, dreamed was possible, you know. And even just the very simple things, like you did, you know, like if you've been in, in Asian countries and you've cooked in those kitchens, you know, they have very simple things, yeah? Chopping board and a knife, basically, and a wok and a pot to cook the rice in. Basically, that's it. You go to all of these places and all of these temples and that's all they have. And they make these most amazing food, yeah? And you actually, they actually have cook all, cook all these great food because they know how to use a knife and they can chop all the vegetables and all of these kinds of things. And we go to a Western kitchen, you look at how many things you've got. All of those things that you've got in your kitchen, all of those appliances are basically a waste of energy just to produce them, much less to run the things. Yeah? You can cook almost anything you want out of a bread knife, uh, of an, a good knife, and a chopping board, and one or two other things. And you can actually cook almost anything. Yeah? So what are all the other appliances? I said, well, I look at Santi Monastery. I said, look at all the things they've got in the kitchen there. And, you know, all the appliances. And you think, my goodness, what are all these appliances doing? And you just think the incredible amount of energy 
that it takes to produce even one of those things. You know, even just the, the plastic on it, you know, it has to be sucked up out of the earth and then you have to refine it and you have to, do, you have to get all the kind of the polymers out and you have to do it and you've got to dye it and you've got someone to design it and so you've got to have pay somebody to sit in a room to design the shape of the plastic cover and incredible amount of work it goes in just to produce one appliance and then all the little bits have to be specially designed and engineered and crafted and they're all sourced from materials all over the world, transported everywhere and you get these things, you know, and you just pay a few dollars for them in the supermarket, you know, you get appliances very cheap these days, you know, maybe a hundred dollars or fifty dollars or something. An incredible amount, how energy intensive it is just to have that thing. Yeah? Yeah? And of course, you use it for a year or two and it breaks down, as it's designed to do. You throw it out and you get a new one. Yeah? Or you could learn how to actually use a knife. Yeah? As has every cook in every country, everywhere in the world, for the last, ever since the beginning of human civilization, yeah? up until the last 50 years or so on, has learned to actually cook just using a knife and a few simple hand implements. And the food they cooked was just as good, yeah. So this is like a, just a very different attitude to things, yeah. And the same with the the uh, accommodation, the dwelling you're staying in. You know, you'd stay in a, a place which was just just enough. It's a floor. It's a clean floor, bamboo walls, roof roof off the head, uh, roof to keep the, the the rain off, and that's good enough. Like I was saying, we we used to stay on bamboo platforms with just a mosquito net, and that was enough when it wasn't raining, or not raining too much, for it rained occasionally, never mind, but when it was raining heavily, then you needed some more, more shelter. And so we'd have little huts for that. Uh, so, again, that's all. You know, you realise that's it. And as long as it's not raining too hard, you know, just a bamboo platform, about half the size of one of these mats. And literally, that's it. And you just spend all day there, sitting meditation, with a little track next to it, walking, sitting, walking, sitting. And that was it. And that was your life. Nothing else. Just walking meditation, sitting meditation. Yeah. And then just a few clothes, yeah, just the few robes that we have on. You saw when I came in today, you saw this bag over here. I carried in. This bag isn't the bag that I just happened to carry. I'm, I'm going to Hamburg tomorrow, which is very bad for my carbon footprint, I know. So I apologize for that. But that's a bag I'm taking. So that's, that's two weeks worth of luggage, okay? Right? So this is how much we can get by with. Yeah? So what do we actually need? Yeah? And we, 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 when you take it back to that level, you realize this is the difference between need and greed, of course, isn't it? That's actually what you need. And of course, conditions are different. If you're in a colder climate, well, you need a few more clothes and these kinds of things. So that's just normal. But that's actually what you can get by with. But what do you actually have? Yeah? What do we actually have? And we, we tell ourselves, we get accustomed to and we think that we need these things. Yeah, of course, we don't need them at all. So I think it's a very, very good uh, experience for us to, to, to try living in this way for a while, yeah? To maybe, maybe we're not all going to become monks and nuns, but at least to get, get, a, get a taste of, of what that's like. You know, spend some time in a monastery or spend some time in poorer countries. See what people get by with and see how, how happy they are with those things. And then you ask yourself, do I need all this stuff? Is this what my life's about? And, you know, to, to bring that into context with what I was talking about earlier with meditation, you know, is it right? Is it ethical for me? I can be a, a rich person in, in, a, in a wealthy country like this. And when I say a rich person, I mean probably everyone here. Okay, we're all rich by world standards. Okay, we're all probably in the top 1% of wealth of human beings ever in the history of humanity, okay? I would guess. We're all pretty rich. Is it okay for me to be a rich person, to be sitting in my big home, fueling it up with all this, you know, heat and energy and all of these kinds of things, and to go there and sit and uh, think, oh, I can meditate and purify my mind? Is that ethical? Somebody else is, where, what the, what's the cost of that? It's all cost in terms of externalities, yeah? And this is, the, this is the way a capitalist economy works, is that profit is generated by being able to make somebody else pay for the loss, okay? So in this case, usually who pays for the loss is the third world and the environment. They're, they're, the disempowered pay the, pay the price, yeah? So we enjoy the benefits, 
where the empowered, where the literate classes, the educated classes, the wealthy classes, we are empowered. We can have uh, our government spend you know, billions of dollars on defence forces and things like that to protect our borders so we can protect our way of life. And we can grumble about their policies. We can say we don't like John Howard's refugee policies, but we still benefit because we, our lifestyle is still protected. Yeah? And the cost of our way of life is largely externalised. Yeah? And, uh, of course, there's some horrific, absolutely horrific reports come out recently from China about the, um, the environmental conditions there, you know, and the incredible sicknesses and diseases that they're having there now because of the, largely because of the industrial pollution, yeah? <laughs> Where was this made, yeah? <laughs> yeah? Where was almost everything? Why, why can we buy Chinese goods? Oh, you go, oh, it's great, you know? You can go down, you need to buy a new power drill. Hey, you can get a power drill these days, only 30 bucks in the hardware shop. It's fantastic, you know? Who's paying for that? The cost of that is still there. The cost of producing that thing is still there. It's a very complex, sophisticated device. It's taken a lot of engineering, a lot of design, a lot of thought, a lot of resources to produce it. Somebody's paying the cost somewhere. If I'm not paying it, who is? Yeah? And then we look, oh, somebody else in the world is starving. Somebody else in the world has got lead in their drinking water. Somebody else in the world uh, has got so many problems you can't even begin to count them. 